Okay, so the next thing in compound that we need to understand is how um, supply and borrow rates are actually calculated. So again, I've got a number of examples of the mechanics, and uh, it's important uh, to go through uh, these details to understand what's happening. So um, again, if you're supplying a capital, uh, you should get a rate of return for that. And if you're borrowing, you, you need to pay something. Okay, so uh, these rates are compounded um, every 15 seconds, 15 to 18 seconds on the Ethereum uh, blockchain. Okay, so it's interesting that this produces something that we talk about in finance a, a lot, but it's mainly theoretical, uh, a continuous interest rate. So this is, uh, in traditional banking, maybe you've got a daily uh, compounded uh, rate. Well, this is one step beyond that, where you're compounding every 15 to 18 uh, seconds. So uh, some terminology that we'll talk about. Um, and one thing is the utilization. So the utilization has to do with the amount of borrowing relative to the amount of supply. Okay, so you can never have the situation where you're borrowing more than the supply. So the amount of borrowing is always less than the supply. So uh, the utilization rate, so that is literally the amount borrowed divided by the supply, um, that is going to be a parameter that's going to play an important role in this, uh, this protocol. And uh, there are other parameters that are set by the compound governance. So compound, again, is a decentralized uh, protocol. Like Maker, uh, it has a uh, governance uh, structure that is decentralized. Okay, so let's go through some formulas here. Um, and the first thing we'll establish is the, uh, the borrow uh, formula. So the borrow formula is going to be an increasing function. Um, and the y-intercept is going to be the base rate. And, um, and, and, and I will make assumptions uh, in terms of what that actually uh, looks like. And, uh, and that is the rate where there's zero uh, borrowing a demand. And then there will be a slope. And that slope represents the rate of change in the rates. So the slope and the intercept, uh, these can be different for any ERC-20 asset that's supported uh, in this platform. Okay, so, so let's kind of go through um, and talk about uh, some examples and some generalizations. Uh, it's also possible that the formula is more complex than a linear formula. So it might be that there's a kink in the formula. So, so think of it as at some point, the slope becomes much steeper. And, uh, and we'll go through an example of this particular situation, but the idea is that once you get close to capacity, you want to start discouraging uh, borrowing. And one way to do that is to jack up the rate uh, faster than a linear rate. So again, we will, uh, we will go through an example uh, like that. So um, this is uh, very mechanical and, and very uh, straightforward. So on the other side, we've got the suppliers of liquidity. So there's a supplier uh, interest rate. So um, that rate is going to be the borrow rate times the utilization ratio. Okay, which uh, kind of makes sense, and we will go through lots of examples here. That um, that think of it as suppose nobody's doing any borrowing, there's no revenue, so there's nothing to pay out in terms of uh, the supply interest rate, or if 50% of the money um, 
is borrowed, then you collect uh, the interest on that, and then you need to distribute it amongst all of the suppliers. Okay, and that's where the utilization ratio actually comes in uh, to play. There's also something important called a reserve factor. So this is uh, an amount of the revenue that's coming from the people borrowing that's set aside uh, as a reserve. So the suppliers actually don't get that. And this reserve pool is important um, because there could be a situation, like we talked about with MakerDAO, where um, there's a default. So being a situation where we've got under collateralization. And this reserve pool is actually used to cover that. And uh, there is also, uh, you know, various mechanisms that are designed to mitigate the risk and maintain the confidence in this particular uh, protocol. So let's go through uh, some examples. Um, so let's say uh, in the dye market, uh, there's 100 million uh, that's supplied and 50 million is borrowed. Okay, so, um, so people have put in as a supply 100 million uh, dye and within this compound market, 50 million uh, is borrowed. And now suppose the base rate is 1% and the slope is 10% or 0.1. So 50 million is borrowed, so the utilization is 50%. So the formula would be the 0.5, which is the 50%, times 0.1 plus the base rate, which is 0.01, and that equals 0.06 or 6%. Okay, so um, if we ignore the uh, reserve factor, then what would be paid out to the suppliers would be the 6% times uh, 0.5. So 3% would be paid out to the suppliers. So again, notice that the suppliers are getting less. So the borrowers are paying more. It, like I know it's a bit of a stretch for an analogy, but in a banking situation, the rate that you get for supplying your capital in a savings account or certificate of deposit is far less than what the borrowers are actually paying. So it's a similar uh, idea. Okay, so uh, this is also important. The borrow rate is not a marginal rate. It's the rate for all borrowers. So this rate can be changing uh, through time. So for example, suppose we think, uh, we know that there's 50 million that's borrowed. But let's think of it in two chunks. Suppose somebody comes in and borrows 25, and then the next person comes in and borrows 25. So if you think about that first chunk, well, um, let's calculate the rate. Well, that's um, 25 million, so uh, 25 uh, times uh, 0.1, and then we've got the um, the base rate of 1%, so we get 3.5%. So if that was the entire amount of borrowing, then um, the borrow rate would be 3.5%. So then somebody else comes in and borrows another 25. So we've actually already gone through that calculation so the rate will increase to 6%. And the key thing here is that rate applies to all borrowers. So if this is done in two stages, you would think the first borrower is getting a really good rate, but that rate increases. So again, there's not a margin of rate, it applies uh, to everyone. So let's kind of go through this uh, in an example, and now we'll actually talk about uh, the reserve factor. 
So let's say we've got a reserve factor that's set to 10. So that means 10% of the borrow interest is going to be diverted into um, a die reserve pool. So that will actually lower the supply interest rate. It doesn't affect the borrow rate, it reflect, reflects the, um, the supply rate. So it'll be now 2.7. So think of this as um, the 0.5, which is the utilization ratio, uh, times that uh, 6%, and then 1 minus 0.1 is going to equal uh, 0.027 or 2.7%. And again, in this graphic, uh, we can kind of see uh, what's going on. Uh, we've got a borrow rate of 6%. So the total revenue that's coming in, let's say over a year, um, is going to be uh, 3 million. So that's 6% times the 50 that's actually utilized, the 50 million that's utilized. We need to set aside 10% of that uh, for the reserve pool, and that will be um, 0.3 or 300,000 uh, will be set aside. And then what's left, to distribute to the suppliers is the 3 million minus what we're holding in reserve, the 300,000. So what's left for suppliers is 2.7. Okay, so uh, you can see that uh, this reduces the supply rate, but now we're actually making this more realistic uh, in terms of what it actually uh, looks like in practice with a reserve uh, pool. So another way to think about this, and it's important to understand this, uh, is that, um, that this 6% rate, like in the diagram, just generates not 6 million in revenue. That would only be 6 million in revenue if there was 100% utilization. Only 50 million is being actually used. So it's just generating uh, 3 million. And that's why the supply rate is less than the borrow rate. And then it's reduced further because some money is set aside to cover a situation where there's some under collateralization. So uh, it is different, but it is fairly mechanical and uh, intuitive. So I mentioned a kink, and let's talk about that uh, a little bit. So again, we've got 100 million dye that's supplied, and now let's say that 90 million dye is borrowed. So that's a 90% utilization ratio. And now suppose that our formula has got a kink, and the kink is at 80% utilization. So before the kink, We've got the identical situation that we had uh, previously, where we've got a slope of 10% or 0.1. But after that 80% utilization, the slope gets a lot steeper. So now the slope goes to 40% or uh, 0.4. So the borrow rate is going to be much higher um, if that threshold is actually exceeded. And in this example, it actually is exceeded. So again, let's kind of go through the mechanics. Um, the base rate is 1%. So the borrow rate is going to be the 1% for the base rate. And then a combination of the pre-kink and the post-kink. So we've got uh, 0.8 uh, utilization. Um, times that slope of 10% or 0.1. And then we're actually not at 0.8, we're at 0.9. So we've exceeded uh, the 0.8 by 10%. So we add in another term here. So it's 0.1 times uh, the new slope, which is much steeper of 0.4. And then you see what happens to the borrow rate. The borrow rate is now 13 percent. So again, we could do um, a quick calculation of the supply rate and the supply rate uh, in this particular situation. And again, just to simplify things, we'll ignore the reserve factor. Uh, 
0.9, which is the utilization, uh, times uh, the actual uh, borrow interest rate, which is 0.13, equals 11.7%. Okay, so this is uh, how this actually uh, works. So let's talk about the um, advantages um, of Compound. So uh, like uh, Maker uh, DAO, this is a way to unlock value in an asset without actually uh, selling it. So again, it's like a home equity loan where you pledge your house and you get some cash. Um, it's also uh, very easy to engineer um, levered long or short positions uh, with this protocol. Okay, so this is uh, quite easy to do. We did an example uh, and when we talked about a mega DAO about using leverage where you withdraw, you borrow, and then you use that borrowing to buy more of the base asset and effectively take a levered uh, position. So uh, again, um, let me go through an example of how uh, this could work. So suppose you um, are actually in this case bearish. So the example I gave in MakerDAO was you thought the price was going to go up. Well, suppose you think that the price is going to go down. So you're bearish on, let's say, the price of uh, Ether. So you deposit uh, a stable coin into Compound. And let's say that's USDC or DAI. And then you borrow ETH. And then you sell it and you sell it for the stable coin. And, uh, and, and basically, if the price of ETH falls, then you can use your stable coin to buy the cheap uh, Ether, and then you pay back your debt and you made uh, a profit. Okay, so, uh, so think of this as if you did this, you deposited enough stable coin, uh, you get one ETH, and suppose it's worth $200. You sell it, you get the $200, and then the price drops by 50%. Well, uh, you go into the market, you buy it for $100, and then re repay the loan. And there'll be some interest I'm abstracting from, but you can see that this would leave uh, approximately $100 uh, in profit. So a short position, uh, very uh, straightforward uh, to deal with in this uh, particular uh, protocol. So leverage, which we talked a little bit uh, about with the Maker DAO, um, same sort of thing that again, you're let's say bearish on the price of Ether. You deposit a stable coin, you borrow ETH, you sell the ETH for the stable coin, you deposit the extra ETH, or the extra stablecoin, um, and borrow more ETH. And then you sell that again for stablecoin and deposit even more of the stablecoin. And again, what you're doing is getting a, a levered position. And in this case, uh, if the price of ETH actually does fall, the profit would be much greater than the previous uh, example. So this is an example of how to do uh, leverage and how to use this protocol um, for, um, for taking bullish or bearish uh, positions.